Ducks Unlimited Television is presented by Drake Waterfowl Systems, innovators in waterfowl hunting in association with Mossberg Firearms, built rugged, proudly American. Welcome again to Ducks Unlimited TV. I'm Ashley Ward. This week we feature the first episode of our new season with Wade Bourne as host, a great friend of DU and a true waterfowling icon. Wade passed away last winter. In this show from Ohio, Wade enjoys the things he loved most, sharing a blind with like-minded conservationists. Pretty. Beautiful. I'll tell you what. There's no prettier duck, no better eating. Beautiful October day. Look at that hood. Then it's long line decoying for the big water ducks of Michigan's Saginaw Bay with Field Hundnell. Starting now on DUTV. Lake Erie country, we are in northwest Ohio uh, in Fred Zink's cornfield. And how far is it, Fred, from the lake? Uh, about three quarters of a mile from the shore of Lake Erie. Three quarters of a mile right behind us. We're up here to celebrate DU's conservation effort in this part of the world. Got a lot going on here, many different projects. It's also a very historic area. Right where we are around Port Clinton, some of the oldest, or I guess the oldest, continuous duck hunting clubs in North America are still in existence and still hunted and managed for waterfowl. So a lot of history here, a lot of conservation, and a lot of good hunting. These wood ducks are starting to heat up, so we're going to see what happens. We have left over the blind. We're over the blind. Here they come, here they come. Here they come right in the hole. Take them, take them. Alright, that's how we'll do it. Fred's place is uh, right across from the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. So the refuge has all uh, natural wetlands and is wet soil management where we're a row crop. Right. I think you'll find that if you have diversity in your management system with uh, corn, flooded crops, whatever you're doing, and natural wet soil management, it's a combination that ducks love. We had hundreds of wood ducks that came up off the refuge. Got three coming toward us here. That cross the highway there that separates Fred's property from the refuge. Cutting back. And then they would just almost dive into his field. That's where they were coming to, to get their groceries. Get them. Throughout the year, as temperatures change, as mallards come in and pintails leave or teal leave and wood ducks, they're looking for a different food source. So if you have a large property and understand that it is a cycle throughout the year that those ducks are looking for certain things, you'll be much better off. Get On the board. We're on the board. Well, we've been hosting this uh, partnership hunt between the state of Ohio, DNR, and Ducks Unlimited for many, many years. It's cool because uh, we bring in people from all over the United States, DU folks, and show them the resources that Northern Ohio has, and what the state of Ohio has done as far as management, as far as conservation. And it's a great opportunity to meet people and to show each other, the state of Ohio and Ducks Unlimited, how partnerships and friendships for the future of conservation. I'll tell you what, I've seen some pretty sunrises before, but this one is right up there on top of the list uh, with the top 10, I think. It's beautiful. I don't know who shot first, but he got him. You know one thing, it was one of you two. Uh, it was a man <laughs> in the middle. You know, there's been a lot of focus over the years up in the prairies and the nesting habitat. But researchers have also learned that it's important to have mid-latitude, to have areas where they can be protected and where they can get good nutrition while they're migrating. And then again in the wintering areas further down south. Ducks on limited television. Presented by Drake Waterfowl Systems, innovators in waterfowl hunting, mossy oak shadow grass blades, the official camo of Ducks Unlimited, and Ducks Unlimited's Rescue Our Wetlands campaign, banding together for waterfowl. All yours. 
Oh, yeah. Nice shot. Nice shot. Very nice. Thank you. Took one to slow it down. Yeah, I'll tell you what, done. yeah, but you, you finished the job <laughs> with that second one. That's, that was good. Thank you. Got one, uh, got a big Canada on the water. And uh, the wind did blow a little bit, but the temperatures are still kind of mild. And we don't have a lot here right now except wood ducks. Mallards are starting to show up, but we still had fun. I mean, any day in the marsh is better than one in the office. Green right coming along. I feel that this resource and the, and the heritage of waterfowling are, are in a great place and going to continue for a long, long time. We still have a lot of work to do, but it's gratifying to see what's been yeah. accomplished and what is, uh, what's still ongoing. Uh, we've made a lot of good progress here. So we're invited by Mr. Bill Young to come to his camp and really just experience what he gets to experience on a daily basis. And I tell you, their style of hunting, got to have a lot of respect for it. Because you're at the mercy of the weather, like all waterfowl hunters are, but their weather sometimes <laughs> determines whether it's safe or not to even go out. We were actually in the Wildfowl Bay area, which is just off of Saginaw Bay. Michigan has seven managed waterfowl hunting areas. Uh, to provide public hunting opportunities for waterfowl hunters to come enjoy. Uh, Fish Point's one of, the, one of the big ones. It's a neat little story where it's essentially almost three or four sections of land and each one has a large pump station associated with it. We contributed a little bit of cost share on the first phase to replace a pump that, that you know, does one of those sections and then use those to leverage in the, the North American Wetlands Conservation Act funds to do the third one. And collectively, that's a nearly a three quarter million dollar investment in pump and wetland management infrastructure to provide thousands of hunter trips annually at that, at that particular game area. In the Great Lakes states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana, the canvasback has been called the king of ducks. But when it comes to habitat for nesting ducks, the mallard is king. Mallards are by far the most numerous breeding ducks in this region, followed by wood ducks and blue winged teal. Band recover analyses show that more than 21% of mallards taken by hunters in the Mississippi flyway were hatched in the Great Lakes region. The same can be said for more than 9% of mallards in the Atlantic flyway. Unfortunately, the Great Lakes region has suffered extensive habitat loss to industrial, urban, and agricultural development as well as pollution and invasive plants. Overall, more than 50% of the original wetlands are gone, and in some areas, as many as 90% have disappeared. Because mallards are so adaptable, they've been able to breed in these altered landscapes. But researchers have been documenting recent declines in mallard breeding numbers. Several complex and related factors are causing these declines, including reduced brood survival, nest success, and overwinter survival. To bring mallard numbers back, there's plenty of conservation work to be done in the Great Lakes area. You can help. Go to ducks.org and join Ducks Unlimited today. DU Insights is brought to you by Mossy Oak Properties. Find your favorite place at mossyoakproperties.com. DU TV is powered by Mossberg Firearms, built rugged, Proudly American, Mossy Oak Properties, America's Land Specialist, Kent Cartridge, Performance, Quality, Tradition, Biologic, Scientifically Proven Wildlife Products, Higdon Outdoors, Quality, Customer Service, Innovation, That's Higdon Outdoors, and Purina Pro Plan, Nutrition That Performs. But Wildfowl Bay is an inner bay off of Saginaw Bay, and when the wind is really kicking, I mean, you got really rough weather, a lot of times those ducks will actually seek refuge in Wildfowl Bay to get off the main bodies of water. When you're standing there at Bill's camp and you look out across the bay, 
there's blinds everywhere. I mean, this is public water. Anybody can hunt there. They're primarily shooting divers out there. You get your redheads, bluebills, and it, and it works out because these blinds are set up all through the bay. And when the ducks really get to that area, mergs, they'll actually kind of work their way around the bay and everybody gets shooting. So it's just a really neat experience because that's not a style that I'm accustomed to hunting. And to be able to experience that and sit out there and enjoy the morning with Bill was a real pleasure. We're hunting divers. For all you waterfowl hunters out there and that are hunting in October right now, you know it's pretty much abnormally warm across the country. It's 60 degrees this morning, <laughs> but we got a little bit of wind. Right at shooting time, we heard some shooting, so uh, we're gonna sit here and see what happens. This is, uh, this is cool. This is big open water. I've always heard great things about Saginaw Bay, and uh, I'm excited to be here. So we're gonna see what we can do. This is typical late October weather. I mean, sometimes it might be snowing, sometimes it might be short sleeve shirt weather. And today we got short sleeve shirt weather, the wind's laid down, and the ducks just are not wanting to cooperate. It's all you can do, give it a try. If it doesn't happen, you just relocate and keep trying. I mean, that's waterfowl hunting. So we're gonna pick up and uh, we're gonna stay after it though. Working on right now an early morning goose hunt setup. It's cold, it's gonna be clear it looks like, and we got a little bit of fog, and we are hunting a standing cornfield. The geese have been in this field pretty regularly, but Murphy's Law, yesterday they wanted to use a different field. So we're gonna be hunting a lot of traffic geese. The standing corn can be very effective for hunting Canada geese. They're used to it, they're used to seeing it, and you can hide an army, and an army's what we got. The waterfowling in Michigan is so diverse, and that's what's really neat about it, is one day you can be out on the big water shooting divers, yep. redheads, bluebills, buffleheads, some old squaw, right. and then tuck into a little cattail marsh and you're shooting big old green heads, and now we're out here in a standing cornfield hunting Canada geese. Canada geese, I like variety, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, we got a great morning, we got a great hide, the geese have been in this field, so now it's just a matter of time. Guys that hunt this area, they've really got something special. There's a lot of waterfowl in this area. It's very rich in waterfowling heritage, and it's just, it's an area that really, as a waterfowl hunter, you need to come and visit at some point. Let's face it, most hunters just don't have the opportunity to train enough on big water. Then one day, they find themselves invited on a hunt on a big inlet and their dog simply does not stretch out and go long enough to pick those long flyers. There's a threshold. They've been training at 45, 50 yards, and that's where the dog has built up his memory. Now we need to stretch the dog. And the trick is, start close and work back. It's called back chaining. We do it by using memories, not marks. I've pre-placed the bumper on the far bank. Deke saw me do it. Let's send Deke out on a memory, and I'll give you a couple of tips. Here, Deke and digs away. He's taking this line because he remembers, he recalls it, so he's going with confidence. I don't add a lot of distractions initially, not a lot of decoys and spinners. We'll put that in at the back, once the dog is confident. The deke is gonna go all the way across this lake. If you stand here and try to throw marks over and over again, you're simply gonna unsteady your dog. You want to work at least five times in five different locations to say for sure this dog can get across that water. Now he's approaching the bank. As he gets to the bank, he's gonna hit that and say, oh, I don't remember where it is, and start working the wind. Now that's about where the duck would have blown against that bank line. So he starts working the bank line, finds it, makes his pick. And then we have to make sure our dog gets back in the water. And he's gonna get back in and come. 
So once he's comfortable with this, we're gonna move it to another location. Remember, try to get five locations as you stretch your dog out to give a nice clean line on those big, big waters that you may find yourself hunting at some time. Only then do you add distractions. All that has to be trained for, but only after you achieve the distance that you're looking for. Remember, training is progressive. It is doing small things in little pieces and linking them together and train for success. Failure teaches nothing. Get it right on land before moving to the water and train, don't test. Dead. Duck Dog with Mike Stewart is presented by Purina Pro Plan, nutrition that performs. DUTV is brought to you by Bush Hog, performance you can count on. Drake Waterfowl Systems, innovators in waterfowl hunting, native nurseries, hand selected, hand grown plants for wildlife. Buck Gardner Calls, champion of champions, with closed captioning provided by Mossy Oak Shadow Grass Blades, the official camo of Ducks Unlimited. When I teach beginners how to shoot a shotgun, I tell them to mount the gun. Look so they can see flat down the rib and see the bead sticking up. Then I tell them, never look at that bead again. The reason there are beads on shotguns is not so that you've got a sight to aim at the target. The bead on the shotgun is there to help you see the barrel in your peripheral vision. So you keep your tight focus on the target. And that bead is there just to give you some muzzle awareness. Bright beads like this orange bead here can, be, can come in really handy in duck hunting. When it's dark, when you can't see very well and you want to be able to Keep track of that barrel as you're looking at the target. And if you go to a big sporting clays shoot, you'll see maybe half the shooters might have these beads. Other half might have taken them off their guns and thrown them away because they don't want to be distracted. It really, really depends on you and, and your shooting style. But the idea of the bead is not to look at it. The way a bead can make you miss is by pulling your eye off the target and onto the bead. As soon as you look at the gun, the gun stops, you miss behind. As long as your eye's on the target and the bead is helping you move the gun to the right place, it'll help to make the shot. Duck Gun is presented by Mossberg Firearms. Built rugged, proudly American. Being able to travel around to different parts of the country, I get to see a lot of the success stories with Ducks Unlimited and conservation but also get to see a lot of the struggles. And probably, if you ask me what is the most prominent struggle that just pops to the top of my mind, it's gotta be Phragmites. Phragmites isn't specific to the Great Lakes by any means, also a huge threat to wetlands, you know, on other important wintering and migration areas. Phragmites has the ability to outcompete, you know, all of the native wetland plants that, uh, that make a diverse and productive marsh. The best way I'm going to describe it is one nasty weed. And eliminating it has this uh, huge potential impact to restore wetlands and, and one that uh, the conservation community is really struggling to get given how immense an issue invasive Phragmites is. One thing I'd like to do is urge everyone to join Ducks Unlimited. Young, old, it doesn't matter. We need everyone's help. Being a donor for Ducks Unlimited, irregardless of what level a donor you may choose to be, is probably the most enrichment when it comes to sharing and understanding nature, understanding life cycle of the entire wild game system, and the outdoor life. I want to see my grandkid have the same experience that was given to me. My most favorite thing about having the opportunity to travel to different parts of the country and waterfowl hunt, it's not always the shoot. Sometimes you're going to have bad weather, sometimes the ducks just haven't gotten there yet. But one thing, I love taking away new ideas. I love seeing how people hunt in different regions of the country. Ducks Unlimited really carries on a lot of uh, historical enrichments that it was, it was really gratifying knowing my father and mother were really the the folks who gave me personally the opportunity to enjoy this great area in Michigan. It's fun to watch them and it's, uh, you just, it's something I've done it all my life. It never gets old. It always refreshes me and excites me to see ducks like this work. This is a, a great part of waterfowling is just seeing them on the, on the wing. The Great Lakes region faces some unique conservation challenges. 
Fortunately, the people there are committed to making a difference. At all of our DUTV locations, there's a team of great folks assisting with our production efforts. Special thanks to all of you for making this series among the most watched waterfowl endeavors on television, reaching millions of viewers every year. And see you next time on DUTV.